me start with a brief introduction just of myself. Uh, my name is Paul Foster. I work out of the UK as a Microsoft enthusiast evangelist, which basically means I get to play with technology a lot and work with people that spend their out of business hours playing with technology and building things with technology. So um, I get to do lots of fun things um, from playing with robots, making films, sending blimps around stadiums, trying not to get them stuck in the roof. Um, and all sorts of things playing with technology, so it's, it's super fun. What I'm doing here today is talk to you about Microsoft Robotics Developer Studio. Now, hands up, how many people knew that Microsoft had a Robotics Developer Studio? Just the Microsoft guys, basically, uh, which is what I suspected. Um, so, yeah, we've got this um, Microsoft Robotics Developer Studio. What's um, pretty amazing about it is that it can be downloaded for free for non-commercial use um, from Microsoft.com slash robotics. So if you're just playing at home, um, you can take some of our dev tools, you can use the free versions, um, and you can download this, and it gives you a whole wealth of tools um, to play with robotics. And as with the title of the presentation, we're playing with robotics both real and virtual. And one of the really cool things about Microsoft Robotics Studio is that it gives you a powerful simulation time that's very easy to program. So you can program, explore your ideas around robotics in this simulation, and when you've proved they work, or you've saved up enough money, whatever comes first, um, you can then go and buy the hardware and direct the applications and the algorithms that you've been uh, building in the simulation directly to your real hardware, and away you go to your real hardware to start playing your, um, your applications. Now, I'll just plug a, a book that's out by um, the Rock Press, the Wiley people, um, the title actually changed just before shipping because we added a developer to our product title. But the Microsoft um, Robotics Developer Studio professional book um, is pretty much the Bible for um, robotics developers uh, on the Microsoft platform. And I'll be using a variety of um, demonstrations, some of which came from the source code for the book, which is free for you to download as well. So after the presentation, you can head back to your uh, dev station, download the Robotics Studio, and also download some uh, samples that enable you to get to grips with programming um, virtual robots straight off. So um, there's nothing stopping you programming anymore. Now let me ask you a little bit more about yourselves. Um, how many of you actually write real code? Brilliant. And if I said to you, do you write .NET managed code, how many of you So .NET is uh, the, the development environment for Microsoft. It's run inside a managed environment, which means you have a runtime that actually compiles, optimizes your code, and then executes it on the platform that that's currently running on. So typically in a, in a compilation cycle, the compiler on its second pass will optimize your code for the machine that you're on, the, the native architecture, et cetera. Um, with the common language runtime, the runtime of the .NET environment, it means that your application is built and on potentially first execution or on install, uh, the code is just in time compiled and optimized potentially for your current hardware platform. So not just your one, but whoever else is using your software as well, um, which means it's very useful. Now, also we've been able to put lots of intelligence into that runtime. And some of that intelligence is particularly useful in terms of not only code optimization, but also reducing the amount of uh, programmer induced errors that so we have services like the garbage collector, for example, that merely goes through and uh, tidies up after your application. It also um, provides you with the ability to isolate your applications. Um, and one of the key parts of um, the whole Microsoft platform being the .NET framework. And the framework, you can think of in more traditional terms as libraries of functionality. And you can bring those libraries of functionality into your application as you require them on demand. And today we have a, a range of um, services available in various frameworks. Uh, that include mobile development, all the way through to web development, all the way through to client and server development, to games development with the XNA um, framework, and of course with robotics development with the Microsoft Robotics Studio. So I thought I'd, I'd give you a show and tell um, today and just show you a lot of demos, tell you about the uh, 
product and then take you through in the final section, writing some real code to actually build out a custom robot and a simulation environment. Okay. Now, I asked the question just in the introduction, let me ask it again. How many people have got robots in their home? So, I had a couple of people. Yeah. So why haven't the rest of you got robots in your home? Robots today can, you know, merrily vacuum your floor, for example. Um, so, I have a, a different version here. This is the hobbyist's iRobot Create, but iRobot, you might be familiar, also builds a Roomba, uh, which will hoover your floor for you, and will hoover it to a schedule. So you can say, Monday, Tuesday, Friday, hoover the floor, and uh, Saturday morning, you use Scuba, which is their floor washing version, to tidy up after that party Friday night. Um, but nonetheless, they're available today, so why aren't you using robots? Now, I think it's quite interesting in that um, there's a lot of perception there. In America, there is a lot more of a, a technophile, must-have attitude. Uh, but in Europe, uh, we tend to be a little bit more reserved uh, in our application of technology. But the reality is, robots are there. And for all of you that probably didn't put your hand up, I have to tell you that you probably do have robots in the broadest term in your house already. Um, those of you that have a washing machine, a plumbing and dryer, um, a dishwasher, for example, all of those can be described as robotic applications because a robotic application is something that has sensors, actuators, things that do stuff, um, and then some sort of control program. And if you look at your dishwasher, you know, you might have one of those ones that has an automatic session, a setting that determines how much crockery is in there. Then you have the actuators that are sending the water around and pumping the water out, and various sensors to ensure that you have the um, right temperature, for example. So, you know, there are programs there. So when you think of Microsoft Robotics Studio, don't just think of robots with wheels, you know, there's a whole wealth of application from home automation, you know, uh, burglar alarm systems, CCTV, water irrigation in the garden, a whole variety of other um, types of applications. Uh, one enthusiast I met was actually controlling his home home heating via a little EME PC in Zeus, um, using Microsoft Robotics Studio to gather temperature settings uh, from two temperature sensors in his holiday home, um, and then the application also controlled um, the thermostat of his uh, heating furnace to heat the holiday home. So, you know, that is in a robotic application um, and can be built using the system. However, there are more fun robot applications, as I'm sure you can uh, see from behind me. So, who's familiar with RoboCup? A few more people. Okay. So, RoboCup is a, a competition. Um, that's been happening for some time. It just this season has just finished in early July, and basically um, the goal is that by 2050, the year 2050, we will have a robotic football team capable of beating the world's best human football team. Okay, and there's a full range of um, leagues in which you can participate, and those leagues go from smaller robots um, to humanoid, full-size robots to humanoids in between. One of those leagues um, for this year was the Microsoft Robotics Developer Studio uh, football simulation, which uses the NOW um, humanoid uh, built by a French company, uh, which is the now um, is, is now the standard humanoid for the Robo Cup. So let me um, start off and just actually show you that simulation. <coughs> so I'm just starting off the services um, for the simulation, and there we go. We have a whole variety of things. Now, one of, the, one of the things you can see is we have this simulation environment. We also have a referee, which enables us to start and coordinate all these different robots. And we also have um, an extra piece, which goes with the simulation um, for the now robot. Um, now, I'll just ask, um, if you had a choice between red and blue, who are your home colors? Red? Blue? Think blues have it just by the late votes at the end there. So um, one thing, I, I'm more of a rugby man than a soccer um, thing, so I quite enjoy um, the start of most um, soccer matches, so most rugby matches, because they have this, um, just watch our blue players there, the hacker, just there to intimidate our other players. I particularly like the guitar string motion. Um, that's pretty good. Anyway, so we have our teams. Um, let's kick off our match. And basically
basically, as you can see, as raws into action as the robots were. But these robots uh, are very interesting. If I, for example, switch to the red field player, you see that he's already visually determined where the football is. And he's working towards that football. So in the simulation, we have this ability to simulate red hands as well as a wide variety of other uh, pieces of equipment. And we can then run our code through them. So we're not just programming a theoretical world. We can program a variety of things that give us back data from that simulated world. So you can see he's roaring towards the goal. Unfortunately, there's not much friction in this simulation, so the ball merrily rolls on uh, and then goes out, and the way in which we do a throw-in or a goal kick is that to place the ball in the corner, uh, and the robots then have to relocate it. And as you can see, he's really going for that, which is pretty impressive. Let's go back to the main camera. Yep, he's left the blues in the lurch, unfortunately. The hacker didn't help them. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there we go. So these guys, unbelievably, do actually score goals occasionally, um, which is quite good. And usually I go away and come back and there's, you know, it's 3 nil or something, which is quite amazing. But anyway, so what's actually going on here? Well, we've got the simulation of the actual robots, but behind each of those simulations, uh, we've got a, a strategy service, you know, the player strategy. How is the player going to coordinate and communicate um, with his other players? You can run with more than four players or two players on a team, you can have eight, you can have 16, whatever number yet you wanted to, uh, in the simulation, as long as you had the computing power to do it. Because each one of these players, as you saw, has a built-in camera, and that camera is used by the player's, player strategy engine to determine the location of the ball, to seek the ball, or to find it. Um, so there's a whole series of communication between the players, an actual strategy for, um, for score the goal. Chair at all. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole a whole variety of things that have to happen to make these um, these players play the game. And what's interesting is the way in which we've approached robotics, because we uh, present each one of those things I've described, those behaviours, those senses, we present them as a thing called services um, or a software service. Has anybody heard of web services? A few people. So, if you think of a software service in a robotic sense, you can think of a web service, but we're actually using a very specific protocol that's enhanced to support robotics. And for those of you that didn't know what a service was, a service is really a, a software component that can be communicated with um, across a distributed network of computers. So it might be running on computer A over here, but on computer B, I can communicate across a network and talk to it and use its functionality, give it data, and get back results. Um, and that's what's really interesting, because all of these services are currently only running on my laptop. So there's a, there's a lot of technology behind there. And uh, then snuck in another one. That's that zero friction um, doing that, I think. So um, there's a lot of interesting pieces. Let's just keep the competition theme going just for a little bit more, for a little bit more fun. Um, let's paste that one into there. Okay. So this is actually um, Robot Sumo. So people who have been doing Robot Sumo for quite a while uh, Robot Sumo, again, uh, we have a simulation, and that enables you to um, focus on the strategy of your players again, and then um, we run actually physical competitions. So away from a conference, a Microsoft conference, you've been able to you know, tweak and tune your player strategy, and then when you come to the conference, you can load it up on a real robot and actually compete for real, uh, which is all good fun. So what I'm going to do here, using the referee service again, I'm just going to select that I have, so they actually have a PC running on them. So they have a, a small embedded PC actually running on them. It's actually running Windows CE, and they have cameras. So they're actually using a camera to visually identify the opposition, and then they are actually, you know, executing their strategy. And the blue's getting his own back to the football team. Um, the red is out. So we, we'll have best of three, and it carries on rolling. You can see there's varying success 
these things start and sometimes don't um, find everything. The actual robot itself has a number of um, click sensors so that it won't actually fall down the stairs and the, um, there we go, there's the telephone back. The actual play dome has that drop sensor uh, off the edge of the red uh, play area. But also we're using the infrared setting to be able to determine the color difference on the robot so it knows when it's hit that red boundary um, and then can try and turn around and get back. So again, that's another example of um, some simple simulations um, using some real robots. And uh, it's very easy to bring those services directly to um, a set of real robots and use them for real. Now, this is one, actually, of a, a number of competitions that we run around Monster Robot Studio. So think about uh, that as I go forward. If you're a student, you can engage in the uh, 2009 Imagine Cup Robotics Challenge. Uh, and if you're not a student anymore, then there's also the robochamps.com um, challenge. We have a number of interesting scenarios, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail as we go through. Um, and if you are heading off to another Microsoft conference, don't forget the, the sumo option, because uh, we run it at Raja time. And the next time might actually be as part of our RoboChamps finale in October in LA. So, let's actually look at this simulation environment in a little bit more detail. is start up some of the basic simulated worlds um, that we can then go forward and uh, manipulate. So this is um, the a very basic simulation environment. We're just going to have a sky dome, a ground floor, um, and then two objects, a detailed sphere, so a sphere shape that's had a texture applied to it to make it look like a globe, uh, and then the individual box. Um, and, and what's interesting about the simulation is two things. One, we've implemented it using the Agea PhysX engine. So if you're a game player, all game players, you'll be familiar with the Agea PhysX engine. It's used in a number of games. You can use hardware acceleration on it, which is added to the hardware for the physics piece. NVIDIA, which has announced that, has been embedded in their latest wave of uh, graphics uh, chip packages. So we'll all have the physics acceleration before too long. Um, and it also um, is built, this simulation environment is built using the XMA gaming technology. So you can start playing this simulation and you'll see yourself using functionality using the XMA framework of functionality. Um, so you're only one step away from a full virtual game. In fact, you could run as a virtual game to start to simulate it. It's just you could communicate your services across the network um, for other people to participate in. But what's interesting here is that I can actually then move this uh, simulation into an editor mode. And the editor mode enables me to quite quickly take hold of objects uh, such as the box and choose to reposition them. So if I put that up there and then I switch my um, mode back into execution, you'll see the physics engine kicks in and the box wants you forward. Um, there's a number of other interesting things I can just point out. Uh, we have gravity to be the percentage setting for Earth, um, but there's no reason you couldn't change that to 3.7 whatever it is on the moon and simulate the, the a lunar environment for your application development, or even add other um, physics settings to uh, induce you know, friction from uh, wind or other materials, um, or even in, in underwater. So you can actually simulate a wide range of different environments inside this simulation engine. We can also um, build up our simulation uh, environment by actually working through and adding additional items. So I could add a, a Lego Thigh Box to the simulation, give it a default position, and uh, oh, not there, that doesn't look good. That doesn't look much like a Lego Thigh Box, does it? Let's try a different thing. So what's happened there is we've got the physics rendering of that Lego Thigh Box, but we haven't got the uh, mesh rendering of it. Let's try a slightly different one. So what we've seen there is two things which are quite interesting. Um, we're seeing the rendered view of this simulation uh, engine at the moment, the, the, the view that has all the cosmetic glory upon it. Um, but what happened down here on the Lego Thigh is that we've only got um, the physics rendering, how that object has been um, presented to the physics engine, just as a block and a wheel, two wheels and a, and a case for that going forward to back. Um, but typically, you'd expect to see a mesh applied to that. 
it so it actually looks um, like a real Lego Tribot. And um, as you can see with the uh, iRobot I Create, uh, we actually have the full rendering, um, and so it looks much more appealing. Um, now, if I actually switch back to run and then switch to um, the physics mode, you can actually see you know, now how the physics engine is actually seeing those different entities in our simulation. So the sphere, unsurprisingly, is there. Uh, the same as the, the cube that we had. The iRobot Create is quite well built. Uh, it's built as a, you know, as a cylinder with the wheels attached. Um, and you can see that the uh, tie bot there is slightly different in that it um, has that block. But contained inside that block would normally be the uh, mesh that is the Lego tie bot piece. So we can actually view our, our world in a, a variety of ways. And we've got a sort of overlapping uh, series of views that enable us to see things. Um, and the, the, it's important to see how your entity is built so that you can represent the physics correctly inside that entity. Um, so that the, the actual physical uh, mass, if you like, of the sphere is, is held by that small cube actually contained within it, for example. If you had a tall, thin object, you'd want to make sure that the mass was distributed appropriately so that when something collided with it, etc., physics worked appropriately on that particular environment. Um, play with another environment. I'm going to pull up one with um, multiple robots. And, and here's a, a very interesting piece. Now, along with services that we're using to represent um, our various software components of our application, what we actually also require for services is the API, the programming interface. That in the world of services, a contract. And we publish that contract. So you can think of a contract uh, like money. You know, if, I, if I come up here and I want to buy something from you and I offer you money, you know, we have a common understanding that you're producing the goods, you know, or the right change for the money that I've asked, you know, that I'm providing to you. So you can think of the programming API in the services world as being that common understanding. And when you see these two robots, one, the correctly rendered Lego Tumble. Um, and the other red one, that's a, a mobile robot Pioneer 3DX. Now, the Lego robot, it's about 150 pounds. Uh, I don't know what it is in euros, 150 pounds. The um, Pioneer 3DX, that's about two to three thousand upwards um, because it's um, basically dependent on its um, implementation. It actually has here a blue uh, shape you can see on it. That is a Lego range finder, and those cost anything from two thousand dollars up to um, so what's interesting in our world of services is that both of those robots are driven by two motors. They have what we call a differential drive mechanism. So by turning the robot in the same direction, which goes forwards and backwards, or by alternate, alternating, alternating directions on the, on the wheels, the robot will actually turn. Okay. Now we have a, a common contract for the differential drive service. We call it the generic differential drive contract. And that means that I can write my application, same as you, against my Lego robots. And then when I go into work or university or come into some money, I can take that same application and run it on the Pioneer 3DX because it has a common implementation for its drive system, the differential drive. So there's a great level of scale here inside the robotics application. You could be a home hobbyist building this, but also in industry or in research, um, you can take those applications and actually move them across hardware platforms. And that's been something that's been difficult to do in the robotics industry to date, um, because everybody tends to build their, their software very tight to their hardware, and very specific, therefore, to their hardware. So you can't move the application around. Um, so what we're providing is our expertise from the, the business solution to build, and come up with the services with API, so that you can actually um, write software against one robot using common contracts, and then be able to deploy it on a variety of different robots that also support those contract implementations. Now, there's a number of things here that we, we can see. If we actually go just to the physics rendering uh, for a moment, you can see how that table is rendered. So although visually it looked like it had nice thin legs, you can actually see it's made out of three areas, uh, or three um, different shaped cubes are actually presented there. Uh, and that's why the red dots are flashing. They are uh, part of the simulation to show the laser rangefinder. Uh, you can actually see that um, it's not quite correct because the laser rangefinder is showing up those dots on the sides, but not on that middle bar. And that's because the visible mesh that we're using is different from that physics piece. Now, one of the fun 
of things you can do, and you've got to be waiting for me to do this, is actually drive some of these robots. Now, one of the other services that we have is this dashboard. I can use this dashboard to connect to my robots. And there's a number of things that you hopefully can just see in that, that list box up there. There are two motor bases. There's the Lego one and the Primer PDF. And then there's also the Laser Range Finder that's actually running on that Pioneer 3DX, this blue thing here. Now if I actually click on that for the moment, you can see a graphical representation of what the laser rangefinder is seeing in the window below. And that's the data that's being fed back and you're chosen to present it in this fashion. The laser rangefinder is doing a 180 degree arc and, and gathering data uh, in a very fast frequency, uh, repeating across that 180 degree arc uh, uh, very frequently. What I've just done is I've just connected the drive system up to the drive input device. I have my Xbox controller. Um, I can now drive Pioneer 3DX around to my Xbox controller. Um, and if I uh, show you the dashboard again, you can see as I move the representation for the uh, table. So, using those services enables us to actually get together and build a number of these pieces and pull them together in a, in a, a number of different ways. So, how do we actually do that? How do we actually build uh, an environment? Well, I'd just like to build a small environment to show you how we do that. Because we actually have a visual programming language. Um, one of the challenges with our products world is, is not only you know, the expensive hardware, but also the need to be able to process vast amounts of data to keep motors or actuators uh, running correctly. The last thing you want is you know, the, the pet dog being run down by your, run, your robot, for example, or worse, your, your runaway robot shooting down the stairs when you intended to. Um, so you need to have quite a lot of skill uh, to do that, uh, to write a successful robot application. So what we've done by providing our visual programming language uh, and a range of services that implement our active behaviors, we're actually reducing uh, the need for you to come to the robotics arena with a lot of um, insight and experience already. You can actually go forward and use um, the tools quite straightforwardly. So let me show you that this. This is the visual program environment. There are a number of areas. We've got common pieces of functionality. We call them activities in this environment. And then down here, you can see this large list. Now, this is a list of all the services that are currently installed on my computer. Um, so there's quite a wide range. There's everything from um, blog trackers for visual uh, vision analysis, Better Soccer Player is a service that I've been working on, um, so different types of robot there, the Bobot, it's a small robot. Um, we have the generic interfaces for things, another type of robot, the iRobot Create element there, uh, a humanoid control service there, the Lego pieces, etc. And there's things such as you know um, GPS services, so you can use global positioning system. Um, there's all sorts of other things such as uh, speech, so you can actually use um, the speech functionality very quickly, very easily in your robot. What I'm going to do is use a, an activity that knows everything there is to know about a .NET, uh, sorry, a Xbox controller. And I'm just going to add that onto my environment here. And then I'm going to take that um, generic differential drive that I've been talking about and add that component there. So I've got two activities. What I'm going to do is just join those up. What I'm saying when I do that, I'm saying when this certain event runs in one activity, take this data from the output of that event and pass it into this method that's running on another activity. So I'm going to say when my triggers change, Use the output data to set the drive power for my motors. And once I've done that, I just had to tie up my data connection, which comes up in the new dialog box. Now, by pure luck, the output is um, either 0 or 1, and the drive power can be in a range of 0 to 1. Um, it can be minus 1 to, to 1, actually. But I'm going to use um, the actual indicator, the flag value, to actually be the value to drive my motor. I intended to invert those to chart my people, just copy what I did right to left and left to right. That just enables the vehicle to drive uh, as you'd expect it to in a forward uh, and backward capacity. Now, because this is a generic activity, I need to actually tie it to something. And what I'm going to do is 
to support this um, particular uh, service interface, which is going to be Drive-By. So I have my iRobot create. I'm going to put that there. I'm going to save this. see the simulation engine um, start up and then we can actually we'll see a, a iRobot create creating that simulation environment and we'll then be able to um, drive it using my Xbox controller. We'll just wait for the simulation model to, to run up. What's happening at the moment is that we're running this in a in an interactive manner and in an interpretive way at this point in time. That also enables us to debug um, this environment as we go through. When you complete So there's my uh, sample well, there's my sample robot, and as I pull my triggers, you can see I can actually drive my robot around there. And because this is a virtual world, not the real one, I can continue the theme of um, sumo wrestling and being a hooligan, and actually um, run in to that sphere, which of course, being in a real physics engine, continues to run and cause all sorts of chaos um, as we're moving through. Okay. So that's kind of interesting, but let me show you another trick. We've written a program. Let's actually just uh, delete that particular configuration. And let's actually try and import um, a real iRobot create implementation. And there we go. Let me um, remember to turn on So all I've changed from our application is the configuration file. Um, that's, I haven't changed anything else. Um, what will happen this time, if everything works correctly, is that we'll get a browser window opened on my PC, and that will enable me to, con to connect to the appropriate comms port that I'm using in, with Bluetooth to actually control this, this robot. The iRobot Create, in its simplest form, has a, a Bluetooth adaptive module upon it, which I can connect to as a virtual serial port on my so I'm just waiting for this environment to pop up. And then once it's connected, my application can run across that communication stream. So we've actually got a very simple robot, but we have the ability to control it from an application running on a remote PC. Um, so that's a different uh, kind of scenario to maybe the expected one of running um, the robot with everything upon it. So now, it's a shame that you haven't got the Hoover attachment really, isn't it? But you can now see I, I now can drive my robot. So it wasn't particularly difficult to build that application, was it? Um, and the great thing was that we can all do it in the simulation environment and then um, you can merely import one of these iRobot creates and then drive it around um, and add more intelligence to it as you go forward. So a very straightforward way of doing uh, robot development. Let me show you some more complex examples um, from this well. Let's um, let's actually do this. Now this is an interesting diagram in its simplest form. You can see that there are essentially two chains which don't appear as though they're linked. But what what is unique about this environment is that we have this idea of uh, a, a true PubSub service environment, which means that a publisher actually can, can send a notification and people can just put their hand up to receive, to subscribe to that notification. So what's happening is we've got um, recursive count to 10 is actually being kicked off at the start, um, but it actually, when it completes, it fires a notification. And our second and the lower recursive count to 10 is actually saying, I'm waiting for that notification when it comes, I'm going to pass it along with the data that came with that notification to the text-to-speech module. So this will actually go ahead, and if it has sound, it should count to 10. So that was kind of interesting. 
try it again to see if we get a little inherent on this technique. The downward one. The downward demo gods are running for me there, which is good because the machine's running quickly. If my machine was running more slowly, you'd, you'd actually have heard the counting go out of order. And then you think, it's got a program that counts at 10, and then it doesn't. You know, what's all that about? Well, what's really special about the Microsoft Robotics development environment is a, a core piece of our runtime technology. And this enables us to write applications as though um, they are extremely well multi-threaded applications, so they have high levels of concurrency. Anybody, know, anybody understand multi-threading? Can I say multi-threading? A number of people. So you, you, you spin up a thread to do something else while another thread is running. Now, when you have a large project team or a very complex program, having multi-thread, multiple threads in that application usually guarantees a whole series of bugs that are hard to find, so synchronization bugs. Um, so what we've done is we've put the intelligence into our runtime to be able to deliver a multi-threaded execution without you actually having to write a multi-threaded application. Now, that's really interesting because, as we know, when we go forward, we're actually looking at processes now that have multiple computing cores rather than single cores. So my processor might have four computing cores in it. And when I run this program, the runtime can actually spin out pieces of functionality to run in parallel on the different multiple cores. And that's why, um, if my machine was running slightly slower, you would have actually had it count out of order because it could have kicked off a count on one core and then kicked off a count again or the speech of the count on another core. And then depending on how they're running, one might preempt the other. Okay. Um, but then this is really powerful because, as I said, if I've got a four-way um, you know, quad-core machine and then I, I pass it over to you, my application over to you, and you were running actually you know, a quad processor quad-core machine, the runtime environment could break out my application to execute as many computing cores on your machine as you wanted it to use, as you'd configured that runtime environment to use. So without me having to specially and specifically write my application to handle multiple cores, our robotics runtime environment, using the runtime that we captured called the concurrent, the, the coordination and concurrency runtime, we are actually providing a technology that basically enables you to have that high level of concurrency without you doing the effort. Um, and that's really interesting. So each one of these pieces can actually have been running on a separate computing core. And if I actually go to a more complex diagram, you can actually see how this um, how this could pan out. So pretty complicated diagram. You'll notice if you just look at it with a wide view, there are actually a number of, again, disconnected chains, or apparently disconnected chains. But so at the top level here, we actually have um, the Xbox controller giving us notifications of trigger changes or thumb sits changes. Uh, then we're doing some uh, logic that's determining whether we're in manual mode. They hit a button if you're pressing the Xbox controller to, man uh, to enable manual mode. And then we do something with the differential drive if we're in manual, mo manual mode. And then down here also, we're going down and we're setting the vibration control. So if we had a button change um, and we're heading close to an object on our left or right, we set the vibration control in the controller. So the operator, the robot, has both the high and the low vibration sensors to the hand unit, indicating whether we're close to an object on the left or close to an object on the right, or giving them a different degree of, of vibration. Then we have this laser rangefinder again. Now this laser range laser rangefinder again is capturing loads of data very quickly. And the biggest challenge from a robotics application point of view is being able to process sensor data that comes in in great volume like that in a, in a timely enough fashion to control your motors or your other actuators so that your robot doesn't run over the edge of the stairs or doesn't run down uh, somebody in your household. Um, and so what we're doing here. We have the laser rangefinder coming in. We're checking a busy flag in this if statement. And if it's um, not true, then we can go ahead and process some data. We go down here, we set not true, and then we pass the data into these three worker activities. 
Now, those three work activities will be run, as I've been described earlier, as three threads, potentially, if I've got enough computing cores to be able to provide that level of concurrency on my platform. So they can race off, potentially there could be a computing core dedicated to each one of those three activities. And that can be processing the data. There's three of them because we said, take a chunk that's left, take a chunk that's center, and take a chunk that's right from the laser range time of data, and hand it off to those three um, computing activities. So they are now, on our quad core uh, machine, running on three different cores, leaving us one other core to handle Xbox data, which is going to be a lot simpler because it's human line uh, determining the inputs, which is going to be a lot simpler and a lot slower, uh, as well as the motor controls. We're going to have to break up our CPU into these various elements. Now, when the worker process actually kicks off or at the complete, we receive these notifications uh, from the worker process. And they are picked up down here on the bottom left. And then they are moved through. And what we're actually doing is we're just calculating in each worker process for the closest <coughs> point in any of that data. Because if we've got an object on our left, we just really want the closest point to that object. We know, you know how close we are to it. What's the worst case scenario? And then we pass that through, again, with some more logic, some simple statements. We say, if we're manual from the existing bias controller, we increase the vibrations. And if we're being controlled by the computer logic, then we're going to appropriately determine the functionality for driving the robot, which is this, uh, this piece here on this side. So, so that's pretty much the computer logic. So if I run this application, we're going to see our mobile robots climbing in 3DX again in a simulated world. Um, but it's going to be off driving itself this time. And it's going to be avoiding the various obstacles that we have uh, in the way uh, as it goes through and drives. But then I can take over control uh, on my Xbox controller by pressing the right shoulder button. That's the, the flag indicator through my program that we're um, going to take control. And then I can drive um, the actual uh, device. There we go. That's our robot running away over there. And if I press this and then start um, trying to drive it, there we go. I'm now moving it. Now this is um, controlled with vibration to a certain degree. I take my finger off and away it goes again. Now you'll notice we've got some alert dialogues. That was a piece of code I missed, which is basically saying we're um, every time we go go to a manual mode, we're going to send an actual um, alert dialog. So we have quite a complex application to a certain degree. We've got a laser range finder, a potentially $10,000 piece of equipment uh, on a robot that is already a couple of thousand dollars worth of equipment. Um, and we've been able to program it with a fairly straightforward um, graphical fashion um, and, and, and pretty simple. Now, one of the things that I can just show you as well, we've got these worker threads here. They're custom threads. You can think of them as subroutines, or custom activities, I should say. And if I look at the worker diagram, that is how I created those custom activities. I've just created another diagram, which I've then contained inside that activity. Um, and that's all of the processing that's been done for that laser range finding uh, information. Okay. Let me um, give you one other little example just of the power of this environment. What's interesting here is that we're actually using a vision analysis tool. And the vision analysis is a simple vision piece there. It comes with the robotic studio. It's a service you can use. And in this instance, we are asking it to find a red blob. Uh, and it will find a red blob. And when it does, it gives back um, the right coordinates or the average coordinates, the mean coordinates of where that center of that blob is in our view of the actual um, uh, camera view of our frame taking the data from. And that enables us to then drive the robot. So here comes our red ball. The robot will see that and it starts to drive off and find it. If I switch up the dialogue here for that vision service, you can see what the camera is seeing. You can see how it's identifying the red ball. And you can see two other views of, of color and movement and of, of motion trying to enlarge the picture. But in the meantime, our robot's running around the screen. We have this incredibly bouncy ball. 
um, you get into the ability to change some of the physics attributes uh, inside as well. Um, so it will go and find that ball. But again, that's vision processing uh, inside this very simple um, environment, uh, a very simple programming environment, I can say. So we're making it easy to actually build some robotic applications. That doesn't mean you know, designing and architecting and implementing applications is actually that easy to do. It's still a challenge. And that's one of the great things about playing with robotics. Robotics is about you know, the cutting edge of, of computer science, both in an algorithmic term and in an implementation way. Um, I've already mentioned about this idea of our services running across many different computing platforms. How can make computing being brought to bear uh, on a robotic device? Um, but we're actually seeing businesses use this same technology to control their data centers and all their business services Again, they can break up um, the execution of that service functionality across many cores in their computing environments um, to actually run more efficiently and more um, effectively. Okay, let me um, just recap with some of the things that we've seen. Uh, actually, I want to show you a couple of other examples as well before we, uh, we move on. Has anybody heard of the DARPA Grand Challenge? Last autumn, they ran the DARPA Urban Challenge, and that was about putting robotic cars in the urban environment and, and having them drive to obey traffic rules, but also to be able to avoid uh, roadblocks, to be able to avoid uh, congestion, um, and to be able to uh, withstand conditions that might in, uh, include no GPS signals, for example. Uh, and this is a one DARPA entry. Um, it was uh, put together by a group of students at the Princeton University in America, and they built their entire uh, application logic using the micro um, robotics developer studio. So this tool that I've been describing to you and, and using with you know some, some small robots uh, can actually be used you know in the real world with some pretty serious equipment. Um, the, the video, if I were to play it all, goes on to show this vehicle approaching an American box junction. And when you approach a box junction, you have to pull up and then wait your turn to go. So if there are already cars waiting, you have to pull up and then you have to wait for all those cars to cross the junction or turn before you can then proceed. Um, so the, the, this vehicle accomplishes that um, navigation of a box junction correctly. Um, it's one of the scenarios it has to have to deal with. Um, so it's amazing. However, it's still not foolproof. It got all the way through national qualifying. It got to the finals. But unfortunately, one of its final runs, they had some errors. The, the computers weren't running at full speed, and the vehicle started to veer off. Um, so it was shut down with its emergency stop, which was basically a separate electronic channel that turns everything off and brakes off. Um, which is the safety mechanism for these robot cars driving around. Some of them were six-wheel trucks. In fact, one of them hit a building um, and did some serious damage, although it was all on a, an old American Air Force base. It didn't matter too much. But nonetheless, you know, safety was a, a key concern. They had five dual-core servers in the boot of that, that Jeep, um, and they had 25 distributed robotic services running across those services to gather all the data in from the various devices they had, both visual and laser range finding. Um, and then they had behavioral services, and they had control services for steering, for um, uh, uh, acceleration, braking, etc. You can see some more at pad.princetown.eu. This is another, just another interesting one. Um, this robot um, basically was programmed using Robotic Studio to learn how to stand up and balance. It was given a goal, and zero was when it was standing up in a perfect, and it was trying to obtain zero. It took a couple of days to do it, kept just standing up, falling over, all sorts of things, but it actually learned how to stand up and then retain its balance um, using the algorithms that I was going to use in Microsoft Robotic Studio. And this is um, the Jeep. Let's go back. This is this is my own home. This is my home robot. Um, you can tell I'm a Star Wars fan with two young boys because it, it's named A1 DW. A1 because it's absolutely fab, and DW because it's a dimwit. It's only as good as our programmers could be. Um, but nonetheless, A1 DW can roam my house. He's now able to autonomously navigate to different locations in my house. So. Be instructed to go to the conservatory, the kitchen, the playroom, the lounge, the, the hall, uh, and it will find its way there, even with young boys standing in front of it all the time, you know, trying to get it to veer off and head in different directions.
spreadsheets. Um, I'm playing this robot because what I'm doing is I'm trying to create a service environment um, where the robot is the computer bringing services to me rather than me having to go to a computer every time. So my house has you know, a burger arm, CCTV system. It has a Windows Media Center PC. Um, if you don't know the Media Center PC, it just calls TV for you. It has a you know, program guide and all sorts of other uh, media services in it. And I can access those using that same distributed services model we've been discussing. So I'm working up this scenario where I can sit in the conservatory and ask A1DW to check whether Doctor Who's on the board. And it can then query my media center box, which can then look it up in my program guide, check its status, send the data back to A1DW, who can then verbalize it and vocalize it using speech to text. So you can actually tell me that um, Doctor Who's on the board. Um, so you know, I'm building out this sort of set of services where a robot can actually provide some uh, you know, service in the home. Um, I can also, um, and I won't be doing it today, but typically I can also do a telepresence demo. One of the great things with these services is they're transparent in that if you have permissions, you can look inside these services from any web browser anywhere in the world and gain access to them. And that means that you can actually look to see what the service is doing, what its current state is. So I can actually look at the um, services of A1DW and control him from anywhere where I can get a web browser switched on on my current network. So it, it, there's you know, true accessibility to him. Um, and one of those interesting pieces um, is that's something actually I'd like to show you. So if I just go back to a simulation environment, or a computer lab. service environment, you're going to have those two robots, the Lego and the Pioneer. And Pioneer's got a, a webcam on it. Now if I actually go to a browser on my machine and go to my local host, I can actually look up and I have to log on. I can actually look up the services that are running now on this machine. Um, so I could be on any browser that had access essentially to the, the, the server on this machine. Um, and I can look down and I can get to things like differential drive service, and as you can see, you know, I've got all the state of that service in XML. But I can also go down and look at the webcam that's actually running. And we have an, an XSLT transform there that's turning all the raw data into an image. And if I start the streaming process, and then I uh, connect up myself to the motor base here, as I drive it, obviously I've got a quarter of a second refresh rate here. But as I drive it, you can see the image. So again, th this could be anywhere on any browser in the world where I have security and access rights to the, the robot. Um, but I can now see uh, that data. And that's where, in, in, with A1DW, you know, he's got a PC built in with, with him, into him, which does most of the sensor and mobile control. But all the other computers in my household contribute or are beginning to contribute to his activity. So I can have a desktop machine that's capable of doing the, all the visual analysis from A1DW's camera somewhere else running on the machine. I don't have to have all the processing power to enable A1DW to do his work in A1DW. It can be scattered around my local network of computing resources, uh, which is all you know pretty exciting stuff when we get into that sense. And, and as you can see, being able to access the state of those servers in this way uh, is a key facilitator for this piece. So let me see, how are we doing for time? We've got a little bit left. So, should we, uh, we actually build an application? Should we all do some code, some real code? Let's um, kick up the environment and just build an application. So I'm going to use a Visual C Sharp Express 2008. Um, that is the free development tool for C Sharp developments. You don't have to spend any money. And um, thanks to my colleagues in Finland, we have a whole series of uh, DVDs that you can help yourself to, uh, which also already have the product on there, so you can install it at no cost. Otherwise, you can go to uh, microsoft.com slash express and download uh, any of the development tools you'd like there. You can see I'm running the free version. It's asking me to activate it in 21 days. Panel don't have to. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead now and I'm actually going to build uh, a brand new C 
service. So I'm going to just call this sim robot read. And we're going to actually step down to the coding line. Is that good? Okay, thank you. So um, I can set a few simple things up. It's a very simple wizard. I'm going to do my put my blog address in as a, as a contact identifier. And this goes away and it builds me you know, the default um, project. Now, if you've not seen .NET Code before, you might be wondering what all this is. So let me just tell you a few things. These using statements at the top, they're enabling me to bring in a whole series of different framework libraries. So I'm adding a whole wealth of functionality to my application just by implementing those pieces. Uh, then I have the namespace that, that my functionality is going to be implemented in. So that can be seen as one of the framework elements that can be used by somebody else um, to consume the functionality that I'm going to build. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. What I'm going to do is just go and add a few more um, references to this environment so that we all uh, get sorted out. Let's go down and add uh, some pieces. I'm just going to browse to the location where they're stored. I need a whole list, so I've brought some notes so I need to really remember what. So I want to have the simulation elements. So let's go down and grab hold of. I'm sure you can grab hold of series of things, but I need the uh, bunker. I need the differential drive functionality. I want to have the label range function functionality. I need to have the basic column. So these are all pieces of functionality that, that either Microsoft built or other people have built that I'm actually going to reuse uh, as I go through. And I think that's all I've got. So I can add those in. And they extend my list. So I'm just going to double click on these pieces to uh, sort out the resolution for those. Okay. So, um, me actually uh, do this rather than type all the code. Um, one of the great features of the Microsoft development tools is that they have this intend sense, which means that you can start coding and it will start checking the syntax of your application as you work through. One of the other things you can do is use this thing called snippets, which enables me to actually go down here and, uh, oops, not hit caps lock, but hit tab and it inserts code for me so that I've rewritten, I've written already the code I need for this demo. I'm just going to show you how I put it in. So basically what this is doing is just saying all those framework lines that I've added to the, the reference list, I'm now going to add in as being used in, into my application environment. And now we can go down and start building our application. So uh, underneath our environment here, I'm going to um, tell it basically that we need to partner with the simulation engine. So this is where quite literally I'm telling my service that I'm building, that I want to reach out and connect to a simulation engine service and use that, uh, which is what I've, I've just done there. And then I'm going to step down into uh, the start method. And this is basically where we can kick off most of our application functionality. Um, so I'm just going to put in um, some code in box three. And this sets up the initial camera view that I'm looking at in my virtual world, as well as populating that world with um, data. So what I actually now need to do is just get those pieces of data implemented. So that inserts out my set camera. So you can see that very simply setting up the camera position in my virtual world is um, four lines of code, defining a new camera view, setting up this eye position, where it's looking out to using um, vectors that give me an x, y, z coordinates, um, and then placing that item into the simulation engine. So it's not, it's not difficult. And then in my populated world, I'm actually calling uh, a couple of basic elements. So there's nothing in this world unless we add 
like sky and a floor. If you don't add a floor, you can add other entities, but they will fall through. So you can tell me, where did that go? You can't miss the floor because it's heading down, uh, and it falls on forever. So if I've done everything right, you add sky if you go through again. It's, it's fairly simple in the implementation because what I've got is basically um, my sky dome defined as you know, a, a one of these graphic cubes which gives me six views of, of the world as I'm inside it. But then I'm adding two light sources. I'm adding a sun so we have illumination. And I'm also adding a secondary light source which gives this uh, landscape a nice red glow. And then if I move down and look at the ground, um, the ground again is a very simple definition of terrain entity, um, because one of the interesting things is that terrain um, bitmap is actually giving us a height field, um, which means that our terrain won't be flat, but we actually have a bitmap which is using um, various shades of grey to define a height region, which enables us to have an un, um, unlevel you know, environment. So now it's like, oh man, I still have to add six areas. <laughs> I tell you, there's nothing worse than a single day riding home. I mean, you're trying to group of people, and God knows how many people in the venue and across channel networks. You know, it's relief when it runs. But actually, all we've got at the moment is this virtual world, and this virtual world is interesting. But there's nothing else there. It's just a dull sky and an undulating uh, landscape. So. We need now to uh, do some more stuff. And what we're going to go down is uh, go into our populated world, and I'm just going to add um, a whole variety of, of models at the moment. So we can look through. I'm going to publish this code, by the way, on my blog, which is uh, whatyoudo.net. And uh, it's old schoolboy English, whatyoudo.net, um, which is W O T U D O. And then you'll be able to play with this code and look at it. What I've added is a whole series of furniture items because I just want to show you the bits. So let's have a look at these. Now, you can build items in the Simulator world in a number of ways. You can build them very simply from blocks like we would in Second Life, building cubes and leveling them and turning them and giving them um, physical status and things like that. Or you can actually create a, a mesh in a graphic tool um, like a 3DS Max or a Maya or Blender or whatever you can insert those. But then you can also add, um, as I mentioned before, the physics rendering of those. And there's a, if I switch to the physics view, you might just be able to detect um, some difference. Now, if we start at the back where my cursor is, you know if you've got a cube, you've got two cubes, then as you come forward on the rightmost cube, there's uh, something that looks more like a traffic cone. And then when you come right of the way forward, you actually see something that looks really like a traffic cone, yeah? You can just see that. Um, and if I switch back to the uh, visual mode, you can actually see those three things were traffic cones, but they've been implemented in different ways with a different level of, of complexity for the physics engine. And 
so the, the one third, the traffic cone clearly backs up into the queue and is just doing that vision thing on it. But then the, as you come to the forward, the, the middle one is slightly more accurately measured for the digital imaging, and the one right in the front is perfectly measured for the digital imaging, exact to the uh, visual dimensions that we see. And the same for the tables and for the, the, um, the two sets of tables, the desk table and the curve table. If you were to examine this code in your own uh, time, you'll see that we've used um, triangular meshes and convex uh, mesh uh, instantiation code, which means that we are able to have more complex or less complex physical representatives, uh, representations of these items to the physics engine. Um, now, you might think, well, I always want to have you know, the most accurate rendering, and of course, as you do that, you add more processing requirements to your uh, system all the time. So, you know, you've got one of these powerful, super powerful boxes, um, that we see around the venue um, today, then um, you're going to have to go for a simpler rendering and just use you know, the eye candy way of making it look right, but accept that there are limitations to your physics implementation. So now we have um, our well with some objects in. What would be really good if we actually um, stuck a robot in it? That'd be excellent. So I'm going to use some simple um, technology here to come down. And we've just signed our ad block. Now what's really uh, clever in our environment is that we have a number of, of items, we call them entities, robots, furniture, things like that, that are already built out in much of the robotics world. So you don't have to build everything from scratch. One of the interesting ones is that Pioneer 3DX. But it's a Pioneer 3DX with its capabilities of laser rangefinder, infrared head bumper, webcam, and um, the genetic drive system. Um, but we can then put upon it our own dimensions, our own size and shape. Um, so I can go down and look at the, the motor base definition here. And you can see I'm just going through the creation of our robot base entity. And I'm selecting certain angles, selecting its color. I um, you know, then set up its service that enables us to actually drive the motor service to the differential drive. Um, very little code, but having added that piece now, I run my application again, we'll actually have um, a blocky implementation of that robot uh, available to us with a laser rangefinder, with bumpers front and back, with a robot uh, camera that we can actually utilize. Uh, so you can see, you know, here we have a very simple robot um, that's been implemented in, in that way. But I still actually um, I haven't got anything to drive it. I could go back to my um, machine here and actually uh, go to the control panel Oops. and see all the different services that are actually there running on my machine uh, for that simulation uh, environment. Um, what actually what I'm looking for is this dashboard service that we've seen before. Now I've built my simulation, that's running. I have a motor simulation running, a differential drive. But by creating that simple dashboard that will pop up in a moment, I've added dynamically, if you like, a service to my runtime environment, my actual robot environment. And again, I can now do localhost, connect through, see what the laser rangefinder is seeing, connect to the motor base, drive it using this piece, or of course, back to my Xbox controller as it's still connected, and I'm driving my robot around. Yeah. So that's all pretty cool. We only have one camera at the moment, and you know I like my robot to look a little bit more than just that. So let's actually go down and complete the implementation. Let's do a couple of things. Let's come up to the top here, where we had just our one connection to the um, well, there we go to the partner region. Let's add another one. add our dashboard so that we're actually um, connecting. Now what I need to really do is jump up here and just do another using statement. Uh, you notice it takes us to the top 
taken my dummies, I built a service, or asked for a service to be built, and now I need to have a mechanism to talk to it through. And that's what I've just done, that's what that port is. So now I've done that, when I run this application, if I've done it all right, um, that dialogue that enables me to drive my application will actually uh, pop up and continue to work. Um, so that's pretty cool. Now let's just find my modular robots, my web robot base. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put in my bot step. So you can see we've got R2D2's camera already. So what we need then, basically up here, is um, R2D2's shape being rendered for us. So I'm lucky enough to be able to jump up to turbosquid.com and pull down an R2D2 mesh that somebody else has made, uh, and I can use those. So if you're in the graphics programming world or you're a designer in the graphics world, you can build out with these clunky icons and clunky robots. Uh, for people uh, that you can use the program or other people's program. So let's just see whether I've got everything I needed to do in there. And if I have, then we're going to have R2D2 uh, up there in our simulated world, uh, along with his own robot camera, and of course the laser rangefinder that we never actually saw in any of the films, <laughs> despite the high quality graphics in the last three. So there we go. Hey. Oh, I have to join my dashboard up. So there's the dashboard as well. So that's started. I still want to join it up. So I could actually program this more directly um, if I wanted to. But let's get R2's uh, drive system, his laser rangefinder, switch back here. And there we go. We're now driving R2D2. Woohoo! Although he doesn't fare too well on the unlevel terrain, I have to say. Um, and it tends to come a cropper, so I wouldn't want to uh, dispel any myths at the moment. The opportunity, of course, to implement his rocket thrusters in the leg is there, um, but I'll leave that for an exercise for you to do later. Okay, so, I mean, basically what we've seen is been able to, to build a robot environment. Um, and we haven't, haven't had to write a huge amount of code. The functionality in the frameworks is making it pretty simple for us to do that. Um, and with the wealth of examples, particularly um, the Rocks book, as well as our own video tutorials, they're available on the um, you can actually get into this stuff really quickly uh, and very easily. Now, just before I go, I did want to show you uh, a couple of other pieces, and one of those is quite cool. You saw earlier the um, simulation. Um, so we actually have a vehicle, a, 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 a series one land road, by the looks of it, but anyway, um, a vehicle that we can actually drive and program. Um, so you can actually, you know, look to have your own uh, exercises driving a vehicle around. And I'll just wait for that simulation to pop up, and then I can um, just drive that around. There we go. So there is my uh, land rover in the now familiar rough terrain environment. He fares slightly better as long as you don't go too fast. <laughs> oh, but there you go, it's a Land Rover, so it will stay upright. Yeah? Unlike R2D2, I'm going way too fast. But never mind. That's the other thing you can do, you can scale your motor torque, which is definitely an important thing to do when you're driving a, uh, a simulated uh, Land Rover. But having done that, and there was the camera clip just to prove that the crash Land Rover will be on somebody's blog before the day is out. Oh. Anyway, let's have a look at this, because this is where we're going. How about a simulated city block, uh, where you have to drive your own four-wheel drive in simulated traffic, compliant with traffic laws, 
um, to win a competition. This is part of RoboChamps, RoboChamps.com, and later on this year we'll be making available a simulation like this, um, with a four-wheel drive in it, and it will be your task, if you wish to accept it, to be able to program the vehicle in the simulation environment to navigate the city blocks and to visit certain locations within a time frame, avoiding traffic where it exists, uh, observing the traffic laws, avoiding the uh, roadworks, etc., and ensuring that uh, you complete your mission on time. It's actually robochamps.com where you can go to get more information. So that's going to be a bit of fun. That's one of the various things that you can do. We also have a number of other elements um, that are there. So there's a whole series of things there. There's real robots to be won as prizes, by the way, if you succeed in, in beating your fellow person uh, to delivering the ultimate robot solution in these various championships. You can win um, a whole variety of goodies. And that gives you some idea of some of those locations. We're going to have a robot rescue. We're going to have um, soccer or sumo in the stadium, at least. We have uh, a simulated um, Mars rover. So you can actually program the Mars rover in a simulated Mars environment to complete certain tasks. Now, the one that's running at the moment is the classic maze-solving uh, robot challenge. But rather than a small maze, a small robot, the robot is a, the maze rather is a large robot, a large maze, uh, and it includes a booby traps. So not only do you have cages like you're sitting in now that can collapse upon you and restrain you, um, but we also have James Bond-style ejector door panels, which I'm now worrying about, which if your robot drives over them, um, you get or your robot gets ejected into space and land in a random position in which you have to then succeed in navigating again. So there's lots of fun to be had, and I say real robots to do it. Now, if you are still uh, a student in education, we also have the Robots Challenge featuring inside Imagine Cup this year, the 2009. If you enter um, the solution as an algorithmic uh, challenge um, that runs in a series of heats, basically, using the, the simulated environment, um, if you succeed in beating your fairly fellow countrymen, uh, you could actually find yourself on a trip to Egypt, uh, just by running some computer code uh, and have all the expenses to pay for the trip. You can go to imaginecup.com or see us at the Microsoft booth just down the hall uh, for some more details on that one. And just in summary really, I enjoy building robots. There's lots of problems in the world that can be solved in building robots. Microsoft Robotics Development Studio helps all of us today explore solving common problems, uh, and then we can bring it into a hardware world, maybe, and have that, um, those robots actually built for real. Um, there's a whole wealth of um, resources out there. My own blog is what you do at the bottom. There's the Microsoft Robotics team. There's also the book website, which is promrds.com, where you can download a whole series of um, pieces. So don't forget, this is free to download for non-commercial use. You can also obtain the Microsoft developer tools you need to use it from um, the website, and if again you're a student, you can use our DreamSpark program, dreamspark.com, which entitles you to a whole range of free developer tools software. Um, again, pick up one of these leaflets that tells you about all the software you can get from the back or from the front, and if you'd like to play today, there's the various developer tools there, um, but you do have to go to the web to get Microsoft Robotics Developer Studio um, to make that way to install. So, with that, thank you very much for attention. One coming in from outside line right now. Any questions? All right, well, I'm on the blue for, for a few more hours. Unfortunately, I have to head back to sunny uh, Norfolk in the UK later today. But um, thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for your time.